Thank you very much for coming. Good afternoon. Welcome to this session entitled Observations, Science, Diplomacy, and Ocean Governance. Before we start, uh, two small things, uh, very important things, uh, but briefly, uh, and this was voiced many times today again, um, thanks to AAAS for having accepted this session, um, for having proposed it, in fact, and for the so, and for the intellectual support to this issue because, uh, because this is an incredibly important issue and as we all know from, from the news that this is um, the discussion about what role science plays in society and its policy is not over and that is certainly true for the oceans where it has maybe taken, uh, has not been so prominent in public discussion. Um, also for the organizational support to Lucy uh, in particular, who, who uh, many emails back and forth. Let me introduce the three speakers that are up here with me today. Um, you have their CVs, but very, very briefly, um, maybe in addition to that, be, what's not mentioned in the CV is, uh, well, Zdenka, um, who's next to me here, um, had maybe the shortest way but uh, has been extremely important in the United States as an advocate for ocean observing and has, was the founding director at NOAA for the US Ocean Observing Initiative. And I'm sure you'll say more about that. But uh, Zdenka is also, she just retired from that post and is now uh, has her cons own consulting company which gives her more freedom but also more opportunities to be involved and to be busy. So uh, one of the activities uh, Zdenka is involved in is she is an advisor to a project that I will mention later, um, funded by the European Union uh, called Atlantos on ocean observing in the Atlantic, but I'll come to that later. Zdenka is also a retired Navy captain and in that capacity also had a lot of experience with uh, ocean observing and, um, and its operational uses. Janisa serves as special advisor to the Director General of Science, Nuclear and Technological Development of the Brazilian Navy. So we have two perspectives from, 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 Nash, from the national side, from two very influential countries that have, have uh, both an influence in terms of what happens in the oceans, but also in the way that the world diplomatically absorbs that issue and deals with that issue at an intergovernmental level. Janice, uh, in addition to her official functions, is, is perhaps the most important bridge between the Brazilian government and the international oceanographic community. So she's been involved at uh, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission and she was also vice chair of the Global Ocean Observing System. Christina is the most internationalist uh, <laughs> also in terms of where you live and how you commute, <laughs> and actually commuted to Washington today, just this morning, from negotiations at the United Nations on uh, the use of biological resources beyond national jurisdiction. So this is an ongoing issue. The kinds of things we'll be talking about the next hour and a half are, are really being shaped right now as we speak. Um, Christina is a high uh, policy, a high, High Seas Policy off Advisor to the International, they've renamed that, IUCN, which used to be called the, Inter, what is it now, International Union for the Conservation of Nature, so, so just the, the acronym. Yeah, that does make more sense. Um, so, but IUCN is incredibly important um, because, uh, while it is not known to many people on the, on, on the street, um, it is the organization behind the red lists, behind the lists of endangered species in the world. And so whenever we talk about endangered species, um, the organization that does the groundwork for that and sets up those lists is IUCN. Um, Christina has been extremely active on issues such as marine protected areas and has, has also been extremely entrepreneurial and has co-founded a number of different initiatives, including uh, the Global Ocean Biodiversity Initiative, the Sargasso Sea Alliance, High Seas Alliance, um, and many others. So, when I started thinking about this issue for myself, about this topic, I, 
was a bit of an intellectual experiment because ocean observing is a highly technical issue, something I'll also talk about briefly. Um, and it was about sort of reflecting on the role of science in ocean affairs. Um, and I wasn't sure where it would go because ocean affairs is, oh, is always something very, I grew up in Canada, um, even though I, I, I'm also German and I work for a German organization, but I grew up in Canada. So the issue of something like the seal hunt was something that on one hand is highly emotive. It touches on people's lives, but it's a distant issue, so many people don't understand it. Um, but it's also a highly technical issue when you try to regulate it, but it is also a brutal business. Um, and, and if you mix all those things up, it is very much representative of how we deal with the oceans. But how you mix all these things is, 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 and bring them together is, is the science and, and the politics and the society side of things is, is, is quite difficult. So I was even more astonished when AAAS um, agreed to publish an article in their, in their science and diplomacy journal. However, with the news over the last couple of months, um, I have to say I, I'm convinced that there's definitely more work that needs to be done on this, especially on the intellectual side of things, of what does it mean to be involved in science diplomacy, um, and conceptually. So we talk about the practice a lot, of, but, but I, think, I think the intellectual side of things still could be developed. Um, but what is clear in practical terms is that raising issues of principle or value is increasingly difficult in politics. I mean, we see that here in Washington, but, it, it, but it's everywhere. Raising human rights or humanitarian assistance or refugee rights and environmental protection, they're all highly controversial. And especially if you try to couple a discussion of human rights or environmental protection with specific standards or, or, or targets or, or, you know, forbid, heaven forbid, binding rules. Um, and for the last 50 years, the oceans has very much, whoops, whoa, it's gracious. Been going, it's been going all by itself. Yeah, it is going by itself. Well, mm -hmm. it's weird. Okay, um, anyway, um, so for the past 50 years, ocean governance has been very much subject to, to this kind of um, challenge with states struggling to balance, on one hand, the freedom of the seas and their access to the resources of the seas, and at the same time, um, ha having rights, territorial rights, to the ocean, sovereign control over parts of the oceans, and balancing all of this and mixing in with this sort of the management of, of, of this whole in intertwined space. Around the world, um, societies have deep-seated economic and security interests in the oceans, and fearful that these interests might be compromised, states have sought to extend their sovereignty, and where this is not possible, they've sort of opted for sort of trying to maintain as much freedom as they possibly can. However, states, and that, this was the, this morning in, one, in the session on the Arctic in this room, this was also a topic, you know, states recognize that this freedom is also a source of conflict. And so they tend to negotiate either regional agreements, like for example for the Arctic, or highly specialized ones. And in the oceans field, some of the big ones right now are deep sea mining or, or fisheries. And, and oddly and symptomatic of this whole process, completely separate from the fisheries issues, um, biological resources, as it's called, or genetic resources. Um, and <clears throat> occasionally, states become more ambitious, and they try to agree, or they do agree, to marine protected areas, something that Christina knows a lot about. But at the end of the day, um, these initiatives rarely, if ever, really change reality and the reality that oceans are exploited more intensively and more broadly than ever before. But since states recognize this, they also agree to grand statements. And in the last, we've had a couple of grand ones. The, the, the first and the grandest of them all was as the, the chief negotiator, the president of the third conference on the law of the sea, uh, called it the Constitution for the Oceans, was the UN conference, uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea. Um, and more recently, uh, with a lot of fanfare and bright colors, uh, states agreed at the United Nations to the so Sustainable Development Goals, which we'll discuss this morning. And specifically, um, probably more or less at the last minute, um, also, also you know, in terms of actual time, uh, agreed to a 14th goal on 
to conserve and sustainably use the oceans, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. But unfortunately, despite such statements, there are also scientific studies, including one very interesting one in Science Magazine, which argue that states are very weak on the implementation and that this has you know, real, dire, broad consequences, such as in this one, I mean, this is just one, one, one study, but on the defaunation of the oceans. But today, this freedom of the seas and the management of the ocean space, uh, space is seen as a trade-off, as, as being even contradictory. And as a result, the, the you know, states and the international community they, it has trouble squaring the circle of you know, how do we manage the oceans together but still maintain our individual rights to access. So we know it's hard to agree high principles and then to implement these conscientiously. And in this session, briefly, and this is, a, I hope, the start of a discussion on this issue, um, I, I hope that sort of we, I expect we, and my colleagues here, that we'll explore this, and, and, and in particular, one alternative. And specifically, whether this alternative lies in something that's very technical and, to be honest, quite boring, which is namely collecting data from the oceans. After all, and I, I love this cartoon. Um, oh, it's changed the formatting. Anyway, um, <laughs> the, I love this cartoon um, from 1983 from the New Yorker. I don't know why I don't care about the bottom of the ocean. This is actually, we just talked about this during lunch, uh, but I don't. Um, and this is, if it's true for the bottom of the oceans, then it's definitely, definitely true for oceanographic data. Uh, you cannot photograph an ocean observing system like you can photograph a ship or a, collider in Geneva or whatever. It, this is something which is, is very hard to, to communicate and it makes it hard for the community itself to understand exactly what it's involved in. And yet at the same time, data and information are absolutely essential for, for exercising the freedoms and managing the oceans. You know, we, we rely on data for everything from weather to uh, to fishing and defending our regional and national interests. But for this reason, because it's so important, there's a long history of collecting data. And one of the first people to, to, to get go down this road and really advocate this and actually deliver concrete uh, results was, was, was a Washingtonian, Matthew Fontaine Mowry, who in the mid-19th century studied thousands of ship logs and charts. I mean, these were manually sent to him in Washington, from which he published something called the Wind and, whoops, um, the Wind and Current Chart of the North Atlantic. And he showed with this chart how sailors could use the ocean currents and winds to their advantage, making transatlantic uh, voyages much safer, shorter, economic. But what makes Maori partic particularly interesting, actually, for today's event, is that he was one of the founders of the AAAS. And in fact, uh, when I was looking into this a little bit, doing some, some <laughs> just uh, looking up uh, Maori, I found on the AAAS website, um, Wikipedia page, um, it actually quotes Maori as having advocated for ocean observing at the inaugural meeting of the AAAS where he said this work is not exclusively for the benefit of any nation or age. And in the minutes, the minutes are quoted in the Wikipedia page, and I hope in the next couple of days I can actually get, maybe have a look at the original. Um, in the minutes, he it apparently was mused in the meeting um, whether the states of Christendom, as they were called, might not be induced to cooperate, this is a quote, with their navies in the undertaking, so this is for Janice and for Zdenka, in mm -hmm. the undertaking, um, at least so far as to cause abstracts of their log books and sea journals to be furnished to Maori at the Na Naval Observatory in Washington. So, um, it was in Washington, so you had big yes. footsteps you were involved in yeah. here. Um, <laughs> So more recently, ocean observing has been used to describe a system that, that routinely and continually provides quality control data and information on current and future states of the oceans from the global scale of ocean basins to the local scale of coastal ecosystems. Uh, that's why I said it wasn't really that The act of collecting such data is mainly seen as a scientific and technical challenge, and that's why we get definitions like this. S and, but in practice, this has meant that operational providers of data collect, 
so, so, so weather, weather forecasters, for example, private company scientists have gone out all on their own um, to launch a plethora, goodness gracious, um, a plethora of different initiatives to collect data serving their particular interests and needs. And as one colleague recently sort of wrote, um, the majority of these, now this is about 8,000 dots. Now I've been assured by one of the individuals making this map that each dot represents about 100,000 square kilometers of ocean. So it is not actually as dense as it might look, but at the same time, these, they give the impression that there is a system at work out there. When in fact, the majority of these dots are funded over one year commitments. Well, in fact, all of them are funded over one year commitments or vir vir virtually virtually all of them are, are funded over one-year commitments and, and some over research funding which tends to last for about three to four years. But, and this is the reason for this panel and, and why it fits well in today's, um, today's discussion, is that Sustainable Development Goal 14 might have actually sparked interest to bring about a political set of change. And in particular, two initiatives have been recently launched. Um, by, on one hand, the group of seven, so these uh, smiling individuals, I, I hope this year in, in Italy they'll be smiling like this as well. Um, the group of seven industrialized countries have agreed to support a global ocean initiative, uh, ocean observing initiative. And uh, closer to home in the Atlantic Ocean, um, the Galway Statement Initiative for Cooperation in Marine Sciences was signed between NOAA, the Canadian Department of Fisheries and Oceans, and the European Union. Um, or the European Commission on behalf of the European Union. And this process now involves Brazil and South Africa, and the summer an agreement will be signed um, to involve them. So in a truly pan-Atlantic integrated ocean observing system, and it might actually be feasible if, if we can keep the momentum going. If, if, and it's a big if, um, we can do our homework as a scientific community, um, and if we continue to get the political support that we've enjoyed over the last few years, then in about three plus minus three years time, we might actually see the first operational activities taking place, at least in the Atlantic. But before Maori's vision can become a reality, oh, almost 150 years later, a number of questions still need to be answered. And these are just broad questions, which I'll, a tool which I'll put out to you is, are we ready to internationalize the collection, management, and dissemination of data and information? And since we know that data does not necessarily, good data does not necessarily lead to better governance, would we be willing to use that data and information as a tool for promoting cooperative management? We at lunch talked about the World Ocean Assessment of the United Nations. Would we be actually willing to strengthen the World Ocean Assessment about the state of the oceans using data uh, would governments be willing to do that, and would the scientific community have the capacity to actually deliver that and be willing to, to, to pool resources in, it, in order to work toward such a common goal? <clears throat> and if we answer yes to either of those two questions, then it would mark a fundamental change in the way the oceans are governed. Not because we've agreed a statement of principle, we have those with the Sustainable Development Goals, but they would actually be agreeing to spend money and to make something operational um, over a longer period of time. And this was something that the AAAS and the, Royal, the UK Royal Institution flagged in a workshop uh, in 2010 when they summarized that the international spaces beyond national jurisdiction cannot be managed through conventional models of governance and diplomacy but will require flexible approaches to international cooperation informed by scientific evidence and underpinned by practical scientific partnerships. So, I'll, sorry, I don't actually know what's <laughs> happening here, but okay, I'll have, to, I'll have to get up in a second. Okay, so, but I'll stop here and, and sort of turn now to my colleagues, starting with Zdenka, to reflect on what this means from her perspective and her experience, and what it is that, you know, Ocean OBS could contribute, does it have a merit as a tool for science diplomacy, or are we sort of optimistic, are we being too optimistic? Though you don't have to answer that specifically. Oh, okay. okay, well, hopefully I won't have the uh, automatic transitions that I didn't know I put in my presentation. Well, good afternoon. It's, it's great to be with you this afternoon. As, as Stephen said, I just, oh. It, it wasn't oh, wow, okay. 
All right, so you can, uh, I'll, I'll cue you when to get uh, on the slides. Uh, so as Stefan said, I just recently retired from NOAA, who is the lead of the U.S. Integrated Ocean Observing System, a national effort that does bring together our federal partners with our state, local, tribal government, and industry in the area of um, ocean observing. But before I start this afternoon, by show of hands, how many of you woke up this morning thinking that, oh my goodness, I can't get through my day without ocean observing? Show of hands? <laughs> Jerry, Roxanne, come on, okay. All right, let me ask you another question. How many of you happen to like oysters on the half shell? How many of you are carrying a cell phone? Okay. The reason I ask those questions is I think we have to go back to make the case that ocean observing and the oceans are important to you every single day before we can get to a point of looking at sustained funding for the monitoring the oceans. So now you can go to the next slide. And to do that, a fundamental premise is that the information that we collect through ocean observing needs to be open and available. It happens to be a policy in the United States government that that which is funded by federal funds must be made available. And I'm hoping in the next couple of slides to convince you that it's also a good idea. I personally believe it's a good idea and I personally think that we can show that it's a good idea. And that is an underpinning and a foundation for using these ocean initiatives for the management and good management of our oceans. So I want to talk about this from the perspective of public good, from the perspective of research and innovation, and from the perspective of actually global economy. So you can go to the next slide since you're managing that. So the free flow of commerce has established unparalleled economic growth worldwide. Certainly in the United States, we're a maritime nation. More than 90% of the things we consume or wear or drive are brought in by ships through American ports. Simply stated, without ocean observing, we cannot move commerce. So that cell phone you have, you would not have if we couldn't move commerce. It is that fundamental when it comes to commerce. When we look at things like harmful algal blooms, NOAA conservatively estimates that there's an average annual cost of $82 million due to the impacts on public health, tourism, and the seafood industry. We use observations across the nation for portals that allow you to check to see if it's safe for you to swim in a beach at any given day. A toxic algal bloom in Lake Erie contaminated drinking water and left 400,000 people without safe water. We use observations in the Great Lakes at the intake for the water management systems. So when we need to be able to treat the water, we to be able to understand the extent and the impact. In 2015, the Dungeness crab season was delayed by four months due to high levels of domoic acid were detected. So this is not only a health issue, but an economic issue. Oil spills, certainly the one that is probably most known in folks' mind was the Deepwater Horizon in 2010, a spill that we had not seen, the order of a spill we had not ever seen in the United States, where we had oil flowing from the bottom of the ocean for well over 100 days. It was certainly ocean technology and environmental um, observations from satellites to ships to, for the first time, an underwater systems that allowed us to manage and understand the extent of that spill. A key program like IUSE is important that we establish the infrastructures ahead of the spills and we're not exchanging business cards at the time of crisis. So we were able to bring that technology in Deepwater Horizon and then it's used, this infrastructure, when we have other spills. In 2015, off the coast of Southern California, the refugio oil spill occurred, and because we had the IUSE infrastructure with our federal and non-federal partners, we're able to uh, put in temporary high-frequency radar stations that measure surface currents and instantaneously make them available to the command center. 
We have gliders that are profiling gliders that are out there, normally look in ecosystem in Southern California that we can divert to be able to understand the extent of the oil and the modeling capability is instantaneously made available. When we look at storms that are coming up the East Coast, in our case, hurricanes, we have the observational picket system, if you will, between our buoys and our gliders and our tidal gauges, all feeding the NOAA's numerical models that are supporting hurricane track, hurricane intensity, and inundation, all critical for the understanding for the evacuation and safety of personnel. And the expense for evacuation for Navy ships to sortie is all expensive, and so we want to be able to minimize that impact. But after the storm goes through, the observational component continues. Post-storm, uh, the NOAA and, uh, in, in this case, our IUS regional associations are involved in um, doing navigation response teams. We need to get ports open. Some ports along the East Coast, Baltimore, Nor um, uh, New York, it's $100,000 to $150,000 a day. So if they're closed, one, it's an economic detriment, and two, we can't move those goods. So we're doing the hydrographic survey. We'll do aerial surveys for before and after on the shoreline to support our emergency management. And then after the storm hits, infrastructure is um, breached. So we're looking at oil spills, sewage spills, um, post-hurricanes, all involved in ocean observing. And I think Dr. Sullivan, our former NOAA administrator, summed it up this way. Smart investments in monitoring and observations pay off in building resiliency before, during, and after the hazard strikes. Resilience reduces the cost of uncertainty and supports renewed viability and recover with fewer negative impacts. Observations are essential in providing the environmental intelligence that underpins this resilience as a bedrock of ready response and resilient communities. Next slide. So when we look at research and innovation, I could have picked many of our global programs, but I picked these two um, in particular for the Global Ocean Acidification Network. I like the way they describe it. It is a global phenomena with local effects. And by being able to bring these communities together and share that information and technology, we're able to understand this global issue and its impacts locally in a much accelerated rate than if we were doing it individually or country by country. The one on the lower right is a Canadian program. What I find fascinating about this particular program, the Ocean Tracking Network, it is about acoustic tracking of um, fish and mammals, is that it's underwritten by the Canadian Innovation Foundation. And yes, it is about exporting Canadian technology for the betterment of science. So there's an economic piece to this. And the way this program works is Canada is able to loan these acoustic receivers to other nations, and then a partnership is built along the understanding of animal behavior and in the ecosystem. And OTN is a, what they call a research infrastructure, and I'll come back to that terminology in my last slide because that is an important discussion on the funding models, and it was brought up earlier in the Arctic panel about understanding the funding models. But, you know, again, it's, this is a four-year-old program. And so when you see the extent of international collaboration that's happened over a short period of time, I think it bodes into that necessity to go across borders. Next slide. And then economically. Um, I think increasingly in our current administration here in the United States, this argument is going to have to be one that we make in a much clearer fashion. Um, we look at ocean observing, and I go back to the oysters on the half shell. On the west coast of the United States, um, oysters are not naturally grown. We have to um, uh, put the larvae out and then grow the oceans, and so we have hatcheries on the west coast. And uh, in the 2008 timeframe, the um, complete hatchery 
industry was virtually decimated, and they had absolutely no idea why. They actually thought it was a chemical issue. It turned out that it was ocean acidification, because as they were bringing the seawater in into the hatcheries, the acidic, acidic nature of the seawater was basically killing all the larvae. And it almost decimated this um, particular industry. And so working with NOAA and the IUS regional associations out there, they developed ocean observing technology both inside the hatchery as well as out where they're drawing their seawater to be able to tell the hatcheries either when to draw seawater from the top to the bottom or, you know, on this day, not that day, or now they've gone to treatment of the seawater inside of the hatchery. And I am pleased to say that this industry has now recovered. One of the hatchery owners, he and his wife, it's my favorite saying, it says, without IUs, we would be driving blind. It's like putting headlights on. So here's an industry that critically depends on ocean observing. And for those of you who might eat oysters at the Old Ebbett Grill, which is here in Washington, they get their oysters from the West Coast. Um, the second is, how do we know that there's an industry out there? And is anybody willing to make an industry out of this ocean enterprise? So we needed to take a look at this. The weather, has been, uh, the weather enterprise has been looking at this for quite a few years. So we came up with this study. We looked at companies who are providing buoys, gauges, platforms, and intermediates. Those are using that publicly available data to make a living. And you can see that we've come up with 410 companies, around 7 billion. That's equivalent to the National Football League organization, for those of you who want to do a comparison. And it's in 36 states, certainly concentrated on the coast, but within 36 states. And the bottom example is a fisheries management example. Is butterfish used to be a bycatch for the squid industry. We got together with fishermen, economists, commercial fishermen, the oceanographers. They've come up with a new benthic um, habitat map. And that particular fishery went from an indirect fishery to a direct fishery that's valued at almost 30 million. And again, if it wasn't for the ocean observing that underpins that, we would not have been able to make that statement. So I could go back to you now and ask you the same question as to whether, you know, when you wake up in the morning, do you now understand that ocean observing actually does impact your lives? And, uh, but it is fundamental because I do speak out in rotary clubs and I ask that question and there is no clue that, you know, ocean observing really does impact. So, one more slide. So, but where are we in the community? And we have a lot of organizations out there. And I'm sometimes concerned that we are not speaking in a unified voice. It is very easy to get enamored with your logo and your branded program, your agency, your academic institution. And to all of us inside the community, while we might understand what that means, to a policymaker, to a resource manager, it, ha it, is, it is just a completely diluted message. So I think that's one of the challenges and the hurdles. Another challenge and hurdle is we've talked a lot about the sustainable development goals. The sustainable development goals, if folks even understand what they are, as we talked about earlier this morning, within the United States and in the UN, it's in the statistical side of the United, UN and the United States. We actually have a chief statistician in the United States. We want to be able to bring in that physical environmental observations into the SDGs. We're going to have to learn a new language. We're going to have to learn the language of the SDGs, that, you know, what is that statistical unit or that analysis? We talked about funding models, or we talked about funding models. Um, I'm not naive to think that we're going to change funding models, but we need to be smart to understand funding models. While NOAA signed the Galway Agreement, NOAA does not have the ability to do project funding like Horizon 2020. National Science Foundation has some other abilities to do that, but we don't, or NOAA did not. So we need to understand that. 
I think the other, a big takeaway is, and it's interesting for me because I was running IUS and I said it was an operational program. I didn't talk about it in the science perspective that many of my colleagues that are in the business talk about that. And we have to get past this research and operational. Argo is a program, and that was some of the dots that uh, Stefan showed you. It has a science underpinning and is used operationally every day in forecast. So the United States and our National Earth Observation Plan tried to bring a new language for sustained observing, sustained observing for public service and sustained observing for um, understanding the Earth. And so I submit to you that as we look at how we're going to use all of these ocean observations and initiatives, one, we do need to have that unified message. We need to be able to understand the opportunities and limitations of the very various funding sources if we're going to move forward. And we probably ought to look at it in terms of sustaining our information, whether our roots are in the science and research or in their operational um, perspective. On the national security, it is interesting within the United States Navy, having come from there, the United States Navy talks about playing the away game. So in my last 11 years, I was really focused on the, bringing the civil agencies together. And therefore, that data was available. And that's one thing in the United States is the United States Navy is not doing observations in our own home waters. And so we were able to talk, not be encumbered by that in our U.S. waters certainly realizing the implications globally. That is not so in some of the other nations that we work with on data sharing. And so I submit that where we can agree that ocean observing is good for the public and response, to be able to make that data available, I think, is, is uh, one way we might be able to, uh, to, to talk about that. And I think that I'll, I'll finish there. There are other issues on understanding how to value public good. Where, when is it a, a nation's and a government's job to provide ocean observing and where, where the private sector? But maybe we can get in, into that, into the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. Uh, I wish to thank the uh, AAAS organization for the invitation to be here. It's the first time as a scientist that I attend such a conference, so you please bear with me if I say uh, anything inappropriate, but uh, I'll do my best not to. Um, I think I will bring to you uh, a more uh, scientific dimension of what uh, we are about in terms of uh, ocean observations. And, and while doing that, I would certainly uh, downscale a lot uh, the, uh, the plethora of uh, acronyms and, and important uh, programs that uh, Stenka has provided you with. Um, we know that uh, since discovery uh, days, oops, The, uh, the ocean currents and, and, and surface circulations have no borders. I'm quite sure this is not going to work, so I, I don't think it will. But never mind. I mean, the important message is there is a, a YouTube video on, on, per, on the perpetual ocean, and that provides you with a view of the world's ocean surface circulation. Uh, and that, to me, is the best example ever to show that there are no borders for us to work with. Uh, and at the same time, we know that the oceans provide livelihoods as well as subsistence and income to, uh, to many uh, nations, be it uh, coastal or not. Uh, and it helps regulate the global uh, ecosystem by absorbing a huge amount of heat and carbon dioxide uh, from the atmosphere. To the extent that uh, since the beginning of the Industrial Re Re Revolution, the oceans have absorbed about one-third 
of the carbon dioxide released by uh, human activities, thereby mitigating the full impact of, of climate change. However, as dissolved carbon dioxide in seawater, most of you would know, it lowers the pHD level of the oceans, thereby increasing acidity and changing the biogeochemical carbonate balance. And that uh, concerns about ocean acidification, and it has now been confirmed, but the extent to its impact on marine ecosystems yet to be, is yet to be investigated. The need for data and information about the oceans in some specific areas is, is really critical. We, we must recognize that uh, when it comes to uh, ocean sciences, be it under the national regime, national jurisdiction, or in international waters, we need to set up ocean observatories and observing networks so that we can monitor the impacts of climate change and keep an eye in our natural resources. Um, I like this image very much. It's, uh, it's, um, I think it's a, it's a fictionary image of the sugar loaf in Rio. And uh, it, it gives the uh, idea that what we know is just a drop, and that's the sugar loaf. And what we ignore is a complete ocean. So um, I think that um, ocean science and diplomacy should have that image uh, in our minds, embedded in our minds, when we try to discuss and argue and agree or disagree. Um, Stefan has provided us with some questions uh, in terms of uh, internationalizing data collection management and so on. And he also asked me whether I could dwell a little bit on uh, what Brazil would agree to international initiatives, uh, if it would have red lines, and, and what Brazil would be particularly uh, interested on. Um, as a developing nation, we, uh, we can assure you that uh, networks can bring people together. And I think this is one of the most important value when we try to do business in, in oceanography. Um, it allows for an exchange of ideas. Even if there are disagreements, dialogue is always key, and that is the main motivation for us to keep moving together, uh, whatever we think, wherever we go. That should have no exception to whichever regime or government we, uh, we are bound to face at one specific moment. So uh, we, we, we have to be uh, a very uh, strict and, and powerful on that. The coordination of those networks uh, need great leaders. And those who build with a clear and strong vision, a long-lasting structure throughout a blend of personal happiness and endless goodwill is bound to succeed. So we are much more uh, described uh, as such as Brazilian scientists trying to get uh, information together. Um, this is one slide that I would like to leave with you. I cannot go through that because we don't have enough time, but it gives the idea of uh, the level of compromising that Brazil has been put into the uh, 17 Sustainable Development Goals. So uh, we have, uh, it's important for you to know that uh, uh, a, a council has been set at the presidency of the republic and, and to track actions at the governmental level and sort of uh, monitor what goes on. Um, we think that uh, SDG 14 is, is strongly uh, based on, on fisheries. And incidentally, uh, that is not the sector that Brazil is doing very well these days. So uh, our participation is bound to be uh, somehow more modest than I would expect if we would have a broader view of uh, SDG 14. Um, but yes, we have uh, presented a voluntary report on the implementation of all uh, sustainable development goals. And I think Brazil is, is really uh, 
going for that. Legally speaking, many nations bordering the uh, South Atlantic, including Brazil, have signed for most of the agreements uh, um, in place, and that encompassed the, uh, the uh, UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. We were, one of, we were one of the nations that really signed for that, and we still. And as I just showed to you, our commitment to the Agenda for Sustainable Development uh, has been uh, clear about it. Um, we do have uh, some regional uh, organizations that we are part to, and uh, you certainly know that we are part to BRICS, we are part to IBSA, we have one specific program for the oceans called the IBSA Ocean. And under the sponsorship of Brazil, uh, we have set up, I mean, the UN has set up the South Atlantic Peace and Cooperation Zone called ZOPACAS, also called as the Zone of Peace and Cooperation of the South Atlantic. I prefer the latter much more. And this is a resolution that has been adopted, uh, 41 slash 11, I think, in 1986. Um, with the aim of promoting cooperation and the maintenance of peace and security in the South Atlantic region. It has 24 member states from Africa and South America. There are uh, several official languages, English, Portuguese, Spanish, and French. A declaration on the denuclearization of the South Atlantic region has been adopted in 1994 at uh, a UN meeting uh, and endorsed by the UN General Assembly after a meeting held in Brasilia. Obey with the opposition from the United States, United Kingdom, and France. So uh, its relevance, uh, though, uh, can only increase if we are to consider the underlying notion of a supposedly common perception of an oceanic region that serves as an aggregating element of South American and African countries, as well as its passive contribution, but never really challenged or tested to regional security and stability. Um, so let me get back a little bit to uh, ocean observations and, and the scientific perspective of, uh, of our region, of our target region. Uh, the setting up of the uh, ocean observatories that we now have could only be tackled collectively. It is a culture of welcome, we know that. We, uh, we bring efforts together sometimes uh, with uh, personal uh, sacrifice. Uh, Stenka has mentioned some uh, funding issues and that can only be uh, worse for the South Atlantic, can never be better. Uh, so I think the, it is important to uh, share the financial implications of whatever we set up as an ocean observing system or network because we know that uh, what happens in the south may be of impact to the north. And this picture is, is very clear about it. When we uh, sort of uh, sampled three network of ocean observations that I have depicted for you. Um, most of you have heard about the, uh, the Parata project. It, it is uh, 20 years now that we have started uh, setting up this uh, ocean observation network. It's uh, funded by NOAA, INPI, the Hydrographic Service in Brazil, IRD, and Meteo France. And we are 20 years now of Pirata operations, so uh, despite of the, uh, of, of the difficulties, we are capable of doing that. Um, I think that uh, those initiatives, be it Pirata, be it SAMOC, another important initiative that we have uh, in the south, oops, it's important for us to uh, recognize that uh, having uh, 
other initiatives underwriting to that, such as uh, the uh, Galway, uh, the conclusion of the Galway statement that ended up being on, on Atlantic Ocean Cooperation, uh, sorry, Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance, with which acronym is AORAC, can only uh, help us uh, go further. So I trust that uh, having the UN, the UN, sorry, the EU, Canada, and the USA as underwriters to some of the initiatives and scientific projects that we have in the South Atlantic sets up an interesting international context. Uh, we know that um, to integrate all the observations that we have in place now, we would need a system. And this is what we recognize as being a system for the systems in place, which is the uh, Atlantis project being funded by Horizon 2020, to which we are part. So uh, Stefan has mentioned to you that we are signatories to the AORAC with South Africa, and so we are to uh, Atlantis as well. So the vision of Atlantis is to improve uh, this uh, set of observations that we make and to obtain an international and more sustainable uh, and integrated ocean observing system. We need to work out the reduction of the technological gaps that, uh, sorry, that uh, still separate participating nations, especially of different developmental levels. But uh, I think this is something that has been worked out uh, really nicely uh, with the discussions we've been having at Atlantis General Assemblies. Um, we, we must think that uh, while set, setting up ocean observations, we are ways ahead in terms of uh, collecting data, but I, I personally believe that uh, those ocean observatories and, and ocean observing networks will never replace activities done on board research vessels. And the reason for that is that it, it provides uh, an approach for partnership, for scientific partnership especially when we talk about uh, transatlantic cruises as we've been witnessing over the past years in the South Atlantic. So this one of the uh, uh, transatlantic, transnational, multilateral uh, cruise we had on board a Brazilian vessel that uh, went from Rio to Cape Town and back supporting some uh, important programs that we have set up for the region. Then we have uh, uh, frequent, frequent visitors as well in the uh, South Atlantic. We have the metro cruises that have been uh, very intense. We have some uh, US cruises, not as much this past years, but uh, we used to have. And that brings some very good opportunities for us to uh, improve our capacity building activities and, and, and learn how can we share infrastructure. More recently, Brazil has acquired a new vessel, so she has done uh, a cruise back in 2015, uh, following those eddies that you can see the animation, that's called the Ag Agulhas leakage. We have uh, some eddies that come down below Africa and project into the Atlantic Basin. So we've been tracking those for some time now. This same vessel is, is presently uh, sailing to, uh, to Monaco. She will be doing some uh, very uh, important measurements um, until starting in April until July with some uh, scientists uh, from other nations aboard as well. Um, basically, I think that uh, when it comes to oceanography, to ocean observations, to ocean observatories, to uh, what can we do collectively, uh, those are the uh, three main issues that we have to tackle. Our technological gap, our ship sharing needs, and the, the infrastructure that we have in place uh, to be more implemented. So um, what are the key hurdles that a multilateral ocean observer, observing initiative needs to overcome to be successful? I would place those three, basically. I think that uh, marine scientists are great diplomats. They do uh, interact uh, a great deal. 
they share data regardless of what we wish to do as governments and uh, <laughs> it's true <laughs> and uh, and I think that um, the main driver is, is is their willingness to work together and I think that science diplomacy has well been explored in this regard but I think that uh, we need a good balance between finance economy science diplomacy and so on but most of all I think we need a, a partnership united by principle and the rule of law and supported by an equitable sharing of both costs and commitments. Most of all, the human dimension calls for pioneers, drivers, integrators, and guardians. So this is my uh, inspiration to uh, keep doing what we're doing down in the South Atlantic. I thank you very much. Are you going to be able to hear me if I stand up? Because I think I need to keep an eye on this unruly beast uh, that does tend to get ahead of me. That's uh, First, I'd like to thank the organizers, to thank my co-author, Harriet Harden Davies from the University of Wollongong, who is actually making this a core part of her life uh, and history. So if you have any questions, please direct them to her. Um, I am relatively, can you hear me? That's not a question. OK. Uh, I can, yeah. Could you hear me in the back? Microphone is better? Okay. okay. Uh, I am a relative newcomer to the ocean observation field. I've been working much more uh, in the areas beyond national jurisdiction and sort of the um, law and policy realm, but I have been involved uh, in what's called Oceanographic Institution as a policy fellow in the Census of Marine Life, various EU-funded projects from Hermes to Hermione to uh, the most recent one, Midas, and also engaged, as Jan Stefan said, the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative, which Harriet and I are both part of. Uh, so we're going to be trying to look at science diplomacy and using ocean observations as a proxy for the value of science diplomacy in ocean governance. That's, as Stefan has sort of set up for it, there are in some inherent contradictions in how we manage our ocean. We want to foster competition through, of course, the high seas freedoms, but we also need international collaboration and cooperation if we are going to prevent the uh, fabled tragedy of the commons. Uh, fortunately, we have been able to forge at least some form of consensus on the need to develop a new international legally binding agreement under this Law of the Sea Convention in order to hopefully develop a rule of law that can balance uh, rights and interests and also help to share some of the benefits of this amazing ocean. But the importance of science diplomacy for these purposes is to really inform the why, what, how, and however. That's, um, and of course the why is Science has revealed to us the vast diversity and importance of the waters and deep seabed, from the water column of the whales and whale sharks, the microbes, down to the, the corals and coral reefs. That's, um, that we really did not even have a clue existed in the 1970s when the Law of the Sea Convention was negotiated. That's, and of course, what we also know far better now, unfortunately, is that all the individual cuts that we have imposed on the ocean altogether add up to synergistic effects where the sum of any one, of the sum of two is far worse than any one alone or the two together, which is creating synergistic effects and altered ecosystems as a result. Uh, as Jan Stefan also showed, that we are repeating the mistakes of the past. Uh, that was, we have a pattern of ocean, of terrestrial, degradation, defaunation, removal of the large predators, as well as um, following industrialization. And we're now slowly moving out into ocean space. And the question is, are we going to develop a rule of law for the oceans beyond national jurisdiction that will truly help us to avoid this tragedy of the commons? And I would point out that this article came out um, at the beginning of one of the core meetings of the UN Oceans 
preparation, well, the UN working group to study issues related to conservation for areas beyond national jurisdiction and did help to propel governments to understand what was at stake in the oceans beyond national jurisdiction. So it is a prime example of how science has moved policy. At least it's helped to set the table, if you will. Um, another example is how of science has influenced policy is with respect to deep sea bottom fishing. This is how I first became involved in the area in areas beyond national jurisdiction where I realized that bottom trawling in the deep sea below 200 meters down a thousand meters was actually spreading around the globe and leaving our oceans looking very much like the backside of the moon. But a coalition of scientists, conservation organizations, and key governments, including Brazil, were actually tr uh, able to get the United Nations General Assembly to adopt a resolution calling on states and regional fisheries management organizations to restrain deep sea bottom fishing in a way that would avoid significant adverse impacts or not authorize it to proceed. That's, and as we've heard before, the Law of the Sea Convention sort of provides the ring around all the activities that take place on the ocean. It is primarily, of course, funded, founded for the high seas in the notion of freedom of the seas. Though we shouldn't forget that the seabed area and its mineral resources are grounded in a more noble vision, if you will, in terms of trying to share the management, share the benefits, the monetary, non-monetary, and where marine scientific research has really been seen to be the first and foremost benefit that is being enjoyed by all. And of course, the freedoms are balanced with obligations under the Law of the Sea Convention, and many of us would like to say that what this new implementing agreement is trying to do is to flesh out what exactly these obligations mean in areas beyond national boundaries. And of course, we do now have a global agreements on what some of these parameters should be for ocean governance. Some would say this applies mainly within national jurisdiction, but we're seeing this week at the United Nations that many are saying we really need the same governance principles to apply to areas beyond, within and beyond national jurisdiction, and certainly nothing more fundamental than increasing scientific knowledge in information and technology, sharing it much more broadly, and using it to underpin sustainable use and conservation of our shared ocean. Uh, that, so turning to areas beyond national jurisdiction, as I said, back in that January 20, 2015, governments did agree to recommend the development of this new international legally binding agreement for areas beyond national jurisdiction, the areas in the light blue, and it's addressing four pillars, which include area-based management measures, including marine protected areas, environmental impact assessments, capacity building technology transfer, and marine genetic resources, in, um, including questions on benefit sharing. That's the question we're trying to pose today is, can science diplomacy actually help to create this transition from a sphere of competition to one of collaboration in the two thirds of the oceans beyond national jurisdiction? And I would argue that ocean observations is one of those tools that provides the knowledge that can inform management, can explain why we need the management, and in many ways help to define what needs to be done. Was it in advance? Uh, but here, I mean, the international collaboration is really essential for ocean science to take place itself, but then that spreads out to information data access on which to inform management and helps to build the capacity of our partners in the shared ocean. That's uh, just as some examples. I love this Yeti crab was one of the discoveries during the census of marine life um, that actually feeds off the um, bacteria in its claws. I wish I could do that. Um, but it has helped to develop this um, common understanding of the need for why we need to move forward in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Climate change impacts on the open ocean and deep sea are now being raised by governments such as Iceland, who says we've developed the capacity to destroy our planet, but not the capacity to escape. They said this yesterday on the floor of the United Nations. They've gotten the picture that this is threatening our fundamental well-being, but we also need more applied science to 
understand where and how to place area-based management tools, how to underpin baseline assessments for environmental impact assessments, and how that can all be applied in a more strategic, comprehensive way through strategic environmental and spatial planning. That's, uh, we are gradually gaining more information from the Challenger up to the Census Marine Life, but unfortunately we still have some ways to go, whereas the Census Marine Life, when you started to analyze the data, show that 99% of the ocean remains undersampled. A little bit of homework, so there are good initiatives coming up, which uh, Herod and I are involved in, in terms of the deep ocean observation strategy. And right now, this is really just simply trying to come up with the indicators that you need to employ in observation systems if you're going to get a good understanding of ecosystems and to enable ecosystem-based management. And we're able to translate some of this into a, a recent article that was published in Science uh, just at the beginning of the Legal and Technical Commission at the International Seabed Authority, again, underpinning the o value of ocean observations for applied commercial seabed mining, but also the message from Atlantos, which I really appreciate, is this need for some um, integration and coordination between this sort of cornucopia and concophony of acronyms that we've seen coming up in the ocean observations and, of course, ocean institution field. Um, we've also seen scaling up this recognition that we need knowledge in order to underpin sustainable management, underpin achievement of the sustainable development goal for the ocean and also the whole series of sustainability um, given the importance of the ocean in Earth systems. IOC is now promoting this new global decade of ocean science which can help to hopefully bring new partners in together into the picture. Because what we have seen is that an um, importance of global initiatives did help to underpin the establishment of the Antarctic Treaty back in 1957. It was a direct product of the International Geophysical Year, and it helped to establish Antarctica and the surrounding waters as an area of national reserve devoted to peace and science cooperation. Can we do something similar for areas beyond national jurisdiction? That's um, because we need the science to develop and inform the policy solutions that are at the heart of the agreement. How can we move forward on technology transfer, move beyond simple guidelines on um, criteria and guidelines for technology transfer, which don't tell you what the opportunities are for science and innovation. Benefit sharing of marine genetic resources, developing countries say, the Western countries have the tools and technologies to go out and exploit the ocean um, library, if you will, of resources. How can we participate in that new ocean industry? Uh, developing capacity development. Well, you help to share the tools and technologies. And what I found exciting from the European Union perspective is that on blue biotechnology, they found that the more partners you can capacitate um, to enable, the better and quicker your results will be. It's not something that is a limited resource. Uh, so then, what can d this ocean diplomacy do for science, or what impact will diplomacy have on science? The third pillar of science diplomacy is the new agreement, uh, as well as STG 14, can help to support stronger science collaboration to achieve a common goal of sustainable oceans. Um, it can help to enforce rules and standards for data and information sharing, including ocean observations. How do you translate that? And scientists also have a role in this. You are stakeholders in what these rules are going to look like. Will they impinge on your scientific research capabilities? How can you make sure that they rather facilitate access rather than um, cause any problems? And of course, how do we start to join the dots to maximize coherence um, consistency across the global ocean and prevent duplication. And here I would just flag some of the work that the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative has been doing, led by natural scientists, but they're allowing a few of us um, social scientists and lawyers on board, trying to inf provide information to the UN prep, um, 
preparatory committee on areas beyond national jurisdiction, but also to the International Seabed Authority. And indeed, the International Seabed Authority recently submitted to the United Nations a paper that DOSI had prepared for the International Seabed Authority on the impacts of climate change on the deep ocean. So it feeds off of one another and the um, benefits to all by getting scientists into the working rooms of these intergovernmental processes are clear. Uh, that was to date. The uh, academies have not played a major role in these discussions, though I would admit I was here two years ago talking about areas beyond national jurisdiction uh, with Paul Bork Berkman. It would be lovely to see if there were some capacity that the National Academy of um, American Academy for the Advancements of Science, the Royal Academies, the other academies could start to help governments understand the importance of open data, open science, big data, ocean acidification. You've already done an awful lot in terms of raising public awareness. If some of that could be translated into energy for areas beyond national jurisdiction, we're hoping the whole planet could indeed benefit. Uh, that, so just trying to wrap that up is that this uh, preparatory committee on areas beyond national jurisdiction to conserve biodiversity, to enhance its sustainable use, provides a historic opportunity um, for ocean governance to transcend this notion of competition, create cooperation, understanding, and coherency. Science diplomacy will be crucial in these discussions to enlighten government leaders, to underpin decision makers, and to bring all sides together. And of course, diplomacy discussions at the United Nations will have an effect on science and scientists, and we hope it's all for the common good. Thank you. invent a session that could start the discussion and, and then have the presentations as a result of the discussion. But um, maybe directly to you, are there any questions or comments to what you have heard, to reactions? Just stay, I think it's the easiest thing. Well, maybe if you use okay. Yes, actually, why not? I'll just stay. Hi, I'm a scientist, but also something of a philosopher. And one of the things that bothers me logically about uh, discussions of the sort is uh, the idea of an excluded middle. And the excluded middle that I'm worried about in these presentations is collaboration versus competition. Both are inevitable. There is absolutely no way the world and the uh, international community as they exist now could not collaborate. There is no way that those entities could not be in competition. So we should not be talking about one or the other. The challenge, in my opinion, of uh, scientific diplomacy with regard to the oceans is to find the, the best blend of the two. Uh, and I'd appreciate any comments the speakers have. So I certainly uh, agree with that, the statement, and we see that in the management of the oceans. I think that there are groups such as the Group on Earth Observation, which is not a UN organization, that's focused on all observations as they relate to policy and behavior. And I think it is imperative that there is support to those types of groups where that discussion can actually happen outside of a UN discussion, which then allows those relationships to be built to bring it back into a more formal process. So that's one area that I've worked in in the last 10 years where we've seen some of those more contentious discussions start and the relationships built and then brought back in through the UN process. But no doubt. And then in the United States, um, just looking at NOAA's programs for national marine sanctuaries and the process to designate those areas or marine protect protected area 
only works when you have the ability to bring in all the groups that have those tensions and have that discussion and get to compromise. So it becomes a lengthy process. Um, I would just add, um, unfortunately, I think to date we've had a lot of competition and too little collaboration. And I think we have seen tremendous amount of collaboration in the science fields. And of course, collaboration is what international law is all about, my field. But it hasn't related to how we're using our resources. And so this is a chance, ideally, to try to right that balance. Jenny said, do you, do you want to get in on this or no? No, I was, I was uh, just make a, a very short remark that, uh, of course, when we bring the economic perspective into the discussion, then you, the, the things uh, change a little bit. But uh, as, as long as you keep to the scientific realm of ocean observations, I personally, from my uh, target region, see no competition whatsoever, but just you know, an aggregation of, uh, of, uh, of knowledge and, and, and efforts being done. Mm -hmm. I'll get back to, I, I think that's it's a great point, but uh, in terms of time, so we'll start at the back and then you. Gosia uh, Śmieszek, Arctic Center, University of Lapland. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. And perhaps in relation to the last one, but with a, but with a question to Zdenka. When you were talking about the, um, about the observations, I was thinking, um, could you give perhaps examples, since we are talking about science diplomacy, so actually initiatives or efforts on the international level that could support international initiatives that could support this, or for example, do you see examples where developments in political scene actually are detrimental to, to the projects, to, to the cooperation that you need to pursue for the collection of data? Thank you. So in the regard to international cooperation, the U.S. Integrated Ocean Observing Initiative, a national initiative, is part of the global ocean observing system and is a regional alliance so the, uh, of GOOS. So the United States is very much a part of that international perspective. Uh, the example that Janice gave on the Parada, that is one element that shows that international um, relationships back and forth. So I think the United States is very active in, in all of its programs. Uh, the, from an educational perspective, uh, through the ocean observing community, uh, there's an effort right now of flying a glider around the world. Uh, replicating the HMS Challenger mission. It happens to be uh, initiated from one of our, our universities, Rutgers Universities, but that brings students at the undergraduate and graduate level perspective together, a very small initiative, but I think there's, there's great examples of that. I think the, you know, on your question of, um, you know, whether governmental policies are going to hinder those international. I think that certainly the discussions of the ability for individuals to travel to the United States or for the United States to travel to international conferences, um, be it because of uh, p policy, or I will tell you at least in the last, in my experience, it wasn't so much pol policy as it was uh, funding mandates on travel ceilings that uh, actually prevented us uh, from, from uh, having as much interaction as been had. I think those kinds of issues will always be there and it's up to us as the community to figure out how we can continue to engage, continue to use the technology and the social media to continue to engage and work within the policy um, and administration constraints, at least from a federal government. Because if you're a federal employee, you're, you're going to have one constraint or another. But I think that you'll find ways to work around that. One more. One more.
more, maybe, and then go here. Thank you. Um, maybe I'm playing devil's advocate here a little bit, but this morning at the opening session, I heard uh, an intervention from an ocean scientist who said, you know, if I go and I measure something in the ocean one day, I know that what I see the next day will be something different. It was in the context of reproducibility of results. And then I hear this afternoon that I think 90% or 95% of the ocean is under um, observed. Um, there aren't enough um, observation points. And if I was a politician, which I'm not, and I hear these two things, my question to you is, when can a politician expect to have enough evidence from the scientific community that's reproducible and that represents an adequate part of the ocean upon which I, as a politician, could make policy? What 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 I use was 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 paid for but out of federal U.S. federal government funds in order to provide a service to promote competition in the oceans while at the same time maintaining the standards. And the problem with the international negotiations tends to be that we want to micro manage specific aspects and regulate them while sort of not dealing with that fundamental issue of what is it that we're regulating. And so what we have now is we have 8,000 pieces of technology in the oceans plus collecting data, but they're not there to service a particular policy. And now the question is how can you get this bottom-up structure, which is publicly funded, meshed with a top-down structure, which is about m developing this kind of a a market for the oceans, where we're going to use the oceans, we're going to exploit it, but it has to be in a sustainable manner because you obviously, if you destroy the oceans, there's no more markets. So, but that balance definitely does not exist. Uh, so you're right. You're right in that. Can I just come in here? Um, I think the the value of the ocean observations is to try to create the order out of the chaos, or to see the patterns out of the chaos. And yes, it does need to be long term, and that is the very value of the long term. In the deep seabed, they are saying you really need at least three years in order to detect a rational pattern of change to distinguish between natural variability and what may be going on down there in the context of seabed mining. And three years would maybe just a minimum, um, because patterns do reproduce themselves over 10 years or so. But that is where these ocean, long-term ocean observations are treasure troves, are worth gold. If I may just add a little bit, I, I would try to educate my politician uh, to the extent that uh, most of those observing networks need at least 10 years' time of ocean observations to provide any sort of uh, 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 precise information for the decision-making process. So uh, it, I understand completely what you're saying, and this is exactly where we get at. Uh, we don't have a short-term reply when it comes to uh, observing the oceans. You may even get uh, faster uh, relating to the moon than to the uh, deep ocean. Thank you. That, uh, my question leads up, from, in fact, from the discussions we're having right now, which was, given the need for uh, further uh, ocean observations and new observing systems, it was mentioned the idea of global research infrastructure, which I think has come up in the context of the G7. And my question is, what are some of the most effective avenues for science diplomacy interactions to work out how to fund such global research infrastructures and new observing systems? Um, given that you mentioned the Galway statement, but that there are still challenges in actually funding the uh, observing systems we already have, uh, given the constraints within different countries. Thank you. Maybe make some final statements. We'll start with Zdenka. We'll go through, and then uh, you have yeah, yeah. So I think the 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 main thing to understand is that while we come together globally from a collaboration perspective, there isn't a magical global fund. 
it is still based on national funding, whether it is through Horizon 2020, through National Science Foundation, NOAA, any of our federal agencies, to MP in Brazil. So the, the key, I think, in this discussion is how do we get that unified voice that can convince our in our case, you know, the funding those who are who want to fund sustained sustained observing, regardless whether it's for public service or for understanding the earth. How do we make that con, con, um, compelling and convincing argument? And I and and using that convening power of global communities such as GOOS or the Group on Earth Observation to elevate that voice. And I don't think we're doing it in a way that, well, we certainly aren't doing it in a way that's compelling that we can get the sustained funding. And it is interesting, I didn't, while IUS has certainly scientific background, when we argued for funding, we brought the fishermen and the users, and that's how we got funding increased and knowing that that infrastructure can provide science. But, but we just have to understand it's really about nation's funding and making a compelling and unified argument through the convening authorities at that global is I think will get us success. Um, that was so, I, I guess this is a closing remark and also an answer to the question is, um, as Zdenka said, it's trying to raise the profile of the need, the importance, uh, and the value, looking to some of the users to both document why this is needed, but perhaps to also provide some financial support. And then also start to look, um, Zdenka said it was a $7 billion industry just in the US on investments in monitoring technologies. So is there a way to get investment banks, sustainable ocean development bank, to start to consider financing this type of investment. So thank you very much for coming. Oh, no, um, that's okay. Oh, that's fine. No, sorry. No, that's fine. That's I fine. You <laughs> said no. That's fine. Okay, anyway, we are seven minutes.